the police! With 26 million homes in the UK, we are living on top of each other. They want this land so bad it hurts them. And when neighbours go to war... Are you threatening me? He's just totally out of his head. Why don't you come and hit me? It can turn home life into a living hell. It's horrible living here. You feel like a prisoner in your own house. I couldn't understand why anybody would want to ruin our family. Coming up, one woman is systematically tortured for 11 years. All he was wearing was boots and socks, totally naked. The reason why uh, I showed myself was to get rid of her. One couple's noisy neighbour leaves them at breaking point. That's all I want out of life, just to live in my house and be happy. And two neighbours come to blows. Came straight up the path, then came down the ladder. Coming to me, I grabbed all of them, there was no way I could handle it, so I threw them to the floor. God, they just stood staring into my spot. Oh, that's creepy. On the edge of the beautiful North Yorkshire Dales, an ex-police officer is living on the edge. I mean, all I'm doing really is sitting and waiting for him to come home, for my life to just completely erupt. And all because of the man next door. I've never harmed anybody, male or female. I've never been in any violence, trouble. I wouldn't do that. In 1998, after an injury ended her career in the Cleveland Police Force, Mandy Dunford bought a small Yorkshire farm to retire to. This is Bootsy, my little Shetland. He's a lovely little chappy. I just love being with them. I like the company better than people, to be honest. <laughs> Having found her dream home, Mandy was hoping to live in peace and quiet. But that was before she met her neighbour. He was just constantly in your face, um, just all, always there. You didn't seem to ever have any privacy. Mandy's neighbour was local historian Kenneth Ward, who lived in a cottage next door with his mother and brother. This is where my boundary ends at this gate. And then that cottage is where Ward lives. Although this here is a public bridal way, the whole lot is, is my land and, and he would just roam around the fields, everywhere, even go in the barn. Kenneth Ward's family has lived in the area for hundreds of years. It is a public right of way for, for ramblers, horses, mountain bikes, anything, and it's also the only access to our cottage. In 2001, Mandy put up a gate across the track that led through her farm to the wards. That's how the harassment all started, really. I looked across and there was both Ken and his brother that climbed right on top of the gate and they were just bouncing, you know, with all the force on, on top of it, up and down, obviously trying to break it. If somebody was damaging my property, I'd photograph it or video it and, and provide the evidence. She couldn't because there was nothing Nothing done to damage the damn thing. We used to leave it open because we were entitled to it. Even if I were coming home at the early hours of the morning, she'd get up out of bed and go down in her wallet and close the gate again. So naturally, we thought, well, yeah, we'll leave the damn thing open because she's mean awkward with us. Ward was popular in the community. This local resident asked us to conceal his identity. I don't necessarily think he overreacted. It was just another inconvenience for himself and for his family as they were getting elderly to have to keep getting out and opening gates that they didn't see as necessary to be there. Mandy decided it was best to ignore Ward and his brother. I was thinking they want some reaction from me here. They want me to go out and start screaming and yelling at them. And I just thought, I'm going to just ignore it and hopefully they'll get bored and stop. I was very wrong though. Shortly afterwards, events took a more sinister turn. I came down one morning to let the dogs out and as soon as I opened the door, I saw in a pile down there, it would be roughly about 15 dead mice just being dumped at my back door. 
I was worried they could be laced with some sort of poison and might kill my dogs. It became a regular occurrence every single morning, different amounts of mice. It could be anything from, you know, a dozen to about 30. It, it was absolutely just sickening, absolutely sickening. Because Ken's brother was a local pest controller, Mandy suspected the wards. I started finding piles of rabbit carcasses just dumped all over. They could start at the kitchen door and come round, go into the barn, and they were crawling in maggots. They absolutely stank. You were balking on them. I knew it would be Ken Ward who dumped them. I never actually saw him do it, but he's the only one who's ever around. You never see another living soul around here. Did you ever dump any animals on her land, any dead carcasses? No. So would it be pointless? What, 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 we would have to drive past the damn things if they were stinking and rotting. We'd be, we'd be some of the first to have to smell them anyway. By 2003, Mandy says animal carcasses were being left outside her house day and night. The former police officer was becoming increasingly afraid and turned to some of her neighbours for support. The odd people I had mentioned things that had happened to the kind of didn't really take me seriously. I was under the impression nobody believed me. It was quite far-fetched a lot of the things that I was, I was telling them, I suppose. Kenny's a character, no doubt about it. A very intelligent, knowledgeable, funny man. And people that know him know that he's not harmful. But Mandy claims that five years after she moved in, Kenneth Ward had turned it into a nightmare. Oh, I can't tell you what it was like. Not worth being alive. It was, it was torture, absolute torture being alive. And it was about to get even worse. When Mandy told me what had been happening, I was really, really alarmed and I was horrified at what she was telling me. Coming up, one couple's relationship with next door turns sour. I think that we've got a little bit of a fight on his hands. And two neighbours get too close for comfort. They said we're here to investigate a sex crime. Just outside Doncaster, a feud with their neighbours... He's coming now. He's looked straight at me. ..has turned one couple's home life into a living nightmare. He makes noises, makes cruel comments, swears under his breath and I feel like it's aimed at me. In 1992, Manny McKevitt moved to a village just outside the city. It was nice and peaceful. We could enjoy his garden, sit out and enjoy his garden in peace. It was lovely, really enjoyed it. Mandy and her husband quickly struck up a firm friendship with the couple living next door, May and Jerry Crossland. We used to get on really well. We used to help each other out when we could. But Marianne McNally, who lives on the other side of the Crosslands, was experiencing a very different relationship with them. Unfortunately, next door had got a number of cars at their address, so I could never park outside my own house. I had spoken to Mr and Mrs Crossland and was met with a torrent of abuse. May Crossland told us this was untrue and that at least initially they only had one car. But Mandy was still on good terms with the Crosslands and when her marriage broke down, she turned to May for support. She was praying about how much my ex-husband gave me maintenance money and I thought, what a rude thing to ask somebody. And that's when alarm bells started to ring and I thought, it's, this isn't right. Mandy decided to distance herself from the Crosslands and in 1999, her new partner, Carl, moved in. One day we was talking about having a patio there and I mentioned it to May Crossland and May Crossland said, you can't put a patio there because my overflow pipe runs onto that patio. And I thought, how rude can somebody be? I will live it. End of day, somebody's telling me what I can have on my own property. May Crossland denies saying this but there were about to be more serious problems. Yeah, I woke up one morning and uh, I was greeted with um, lots of water, human waste, um, toilet paper over half of the garden. Stench in the air, 
all the way round up to here. In this dip here, it was about an inch and a half, maybe two inches deep. The stench was horrendous. You could smell the human waste. And Carl says he knew exactly where the mess was coming from. It had come from this pipe that leads all their bathroom waste down the pipe into a drain that's covered over by this patio block, joins up with the drain that's in the alley at the side of the house. We saw the Crosslands in the back garden at this point, and uh, Mrs. Crossland said that she'd seen it already and she'd got a plumber. To their credit, the plumber came, he unblocked it, and that was fine. But three days later, the problem had returned. So Carl went straight round to speak to the Crosslands. Knocked on the door and they said that they'd had a plumber out and it wasn't their problem anymore. And they closed the door on my face. I said to Mandy, I said, I think that we've got a little bit of a fight on his hands. Carl and Mandy had to fix the drain themselves. I feel from that point on, that's when things turn sour between ourselves and the Crosslands. The loud music started and it became where it was every day. And I mean every day, there wasn't a break. On the edge of the Yorkshire Dales, a single woman living alone was subjected to a consistent campaign of terror for five years. I was really frightened. I didn't know where this was going to go. But in 2003, Mandy Dunford says her neighbour's campaign against her became far more brazen and even more disturbing. I was just walking my dogs down here and when I got to the gate, I just glanced across there I looked up and I saw Ken Ward standing in front of his caravan. He had wellies on, but he dropped his trousers and, and they were just hanging on the floor over his wellies. He had his jumper pulled right up under his armpits as if he was trying to show as much nudity as he could. He had binoculars in one hand and he was performing at me with the other. Well, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, you know. I was really shocked and sort of, oh, you know. So I just turned and I started walking back home, but I'm like thinking to myself, I didn't see that, it couldn't have been. And I was thinking, no, he must have just been having a wee. And then I thought, but men don't drop the trousers like that to have a wee. After that first incident, it spiralled really quickly. And every morning, as soon as Ken's brother drove out here to go to work, Ken Ward, would immediately appear and just spend the rest of the day totally naked, performing at me and following me around. Former police officer Mandy tried to gather evidence of Ward's behaviour. I'd worn big coats and put cameras inside uh, with the lens peeping out a bit, but he was always so close to me and watched my every move. As soon as I put a hand towards the camera to take a photograph myself, he would just dive into the long vegetation. It was impossible. I tried many, many times. Because Ward was her only neighbour, there were no witnesses. And in the local community, Mandy found nobody believed her. It was just, oh, you so stupid. What on earth would he do that for? Why didn't she just walk away? I, I don't understand why it was allowed to continue for so long if it was causing us so much distress. Makes you wonder if it was actually exactly as it seems. But every day, Mandy says, Ward's behaviour was getting worse. I went back to the house. He would quite often chase me up the track. Sometimes he would even stand outside my window. Could be for up to 30, 40 minutes. He tended to kind of just follow me racing about wherever I went. Without evidence, it was Mandy's word against Ward's, but things started to get out of hand. I looked up and I saw Ward running at me from over there. All he was wearing was boots and socks, totally naked, and, and he was just here. And I just turned and I ran into the house. Just locked the doors, and that was the first day I called the police. Mandy begged the police to carry out surveillance from her farm to gather evidence. Instead, 
they went to Ward's cottage and issued him with a stalking order. Mandy claims their intervention only provoked Ward. One evening I came walking down here with my dogs, they were, they were loose by my side, and as I got to about here, he came leaping over the wire fence there and he just landed on the track right in front of me there. He had hold of a big rifle. I hadn't got very far away from Ward when I heard the gun ring out. Bang, 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 bang. There was five and I can still hear those shots now if I think of them, it was so frightening. And I just raced my house as fast as I could, ran in and locked my doors. It's all in her mind. If I want to shoot rabbits on my museum property, which I used to do, and she's 150 yards away, that's nothing to do with me. I mean, it's purely and simply because I was killing rabbits. She just didn't want them killing. But Mandy went to the police again. One morning, I saw four police cars just driving down the track towards Wards, one after another, and I thought, God, something's finally going to happen. The police were up about half a dozen from the house, arrested me and I was going to be charged with attempted murder. But in a shock coincidence that same night, Ward's brother had suffered a stroke. Unfortunately, he died out of the blue. There was a heck of a void and a, a, a blank and a sort of a space that couldn't be filled like. Police records show that three air rifles and three shotguns had been found at Ward's property during the raid. But when they heard of his brother's death, the police de-arrested Ward, saying the family needed to grieve. When I saw him back, I just couldn't believe it, because I knew he was going to make me pay for what had happened. I didn't know what he was going to do next. Len and Jeanette Wood live in Colwyn Bay. The couple moved to the pretty seaside resort in North Wales in 2012. We moved so we could uh, do ballroom dancing. And we're just learning to do the tango, the Argentine tango, which is uh, really exciting for me. <laughs> it is for them, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> Len and Jeanette bought a ground floor flat and it came with the freehold of the property. So we've got the garden flat, which means we own the drive, the garage, the front and back garden and the fabric of the building, the, the building is ours. Both the freehold of the property and the top floor flat had a separate 100 year lease. The lease allows the upstairs flat to use the space of the building so, for instance, they are responsible for the inside walls, floor and ceiling. The outside walls are our responsibility. And it's our responsibility to do the work and then collect half of the cost from the owner of the flat upstairs. For two years, the Woods lived in peaceful, neighbourly harmony with an elderly couple living upstairs. But in May 2014, they sold the flat to Mr David Cooper. The first time I made David, he was walking up the path and I invited him into the garage and I told him that I was the freeholder of the flat. And I said to him, I do all the work myself. And he turned around and said to me, he said, well, we must give you something to water. I said, well, it will be half. And he was quite happy about that. Mr Cooper had bought the upstairs flat, but his daughter Annabelle would be the tenant. Within a couple of days of her moving in, I noticed um, six plant pots across our drive under my porch window and a big chimney and a big bird bath. And I thought, well, I'm not going to say anything because it was more important to me to have a good neighbourly feeling and I felt she was a little bit prickly. So I thought, I'll leave it for now. But if any more go down, I'm going to have to say something. Annabelle had only been in the flat for a few days, but Len and Jeanette's tranquil life was set to be shattered. When they first moved in, the first few days, they were moving stuff around, which you expect when new people come. And we left it at that for a couple of days, and then after three or four days, it got louder. And by the end of the week, it was really noisy. There was one evening we were sitting here, and all hell let up upstairs, and the noise was terrific. 
it was like a stampede of elephants going across the floor. So I got up and I, li I could hear the noise and it was like this going like this all the time. I said to Ines, surely it's not going to be like this all week, we'll give them a few more days. And so that's what we did. I was hoping that it would calm down by the end of the weekend, which it didn't do, it would just carry on. It's very irritating. Very irritating. Yeah. Very irritating. It spoils your life. Choosing to try and ignore the noise, Len got on with his building maintenance. One morning I was up the ladder and I was fixing the leak at the top of the gutter there. I was up there for about 20 minutes and next thing is Annabelle came through the door like a raven lunatic. I said, what are you doing up the ladder? And I looked at her and I said, I'm doing the guttering. And she said to me, she said, I don't want you up the ladder. I came back down the ladder. She looked at me and the next thing is she just went out and I went back up the ladder. The mother came, she'd phoned the mother, and the two of them came out, and of course it just degenerated into an argument. She said we were um, invading her privacy, and said, oh, I'm just concerned because my daughters are in the flat very often. And you said, what did you say then? I said, you think I'm going up there to look in the windows and see if you're in the nude or something? I was really pissed off at this point. As I walked off, I heard her say, you don't need your privacy, you're old. And I felt really sick by that, that what she said, that there was no need for this at all. Coming up, things get criminal for the woods. The next day, the police came. Mandy and her partner reached rock bottom. The stench was horrendous. You could smell the human waste. I said, this isn't a home. It's a hell hole. Your home should be a sanctuary. And this isn't nowhere near that. And desperate times call for desperate measures. He was just totally out of his head. I mean, dropping his trousers to his waist and doing that is absolutely disgusting. <laughs> Some of us live just metres away from our neighbours. And when you're that close, it doesn't take much for a small problem. I felt she was a little bit prickly, so I thought I'll leave it for now. To become a big one. Just turned into a disaster. Len and Jeanette Wood's peaceful and happy life had been crushed when new neighbours bought the flat upstairs. In the six weeks, in the time they moved in, they made our lives misery. When Lem was doing maintenance work upstairs, neighbour Annabelle Cooper had accused him of being a peeping Tom. But when they first came, the police, I was outside coming, and as they walked in, I said, I know what we're here for. She says, we've got to come in, she says, because it's been as a sex crime. So I looked at her and I said, what's the sex crime? After looking at all my notes, all my, the log I'd made up to then, they um, said that they should never have been called and it was um, a, a civil matter. After talking to the Woods, no further action was taken by the police. It was a relief, because I know I hadn't done anything. But the police did advise the Woods to ring Annabelle's doorbell to warn her of any future maintenance work on the property. After the visit from the police, I sent David a really strong letter insisting on a meeting. Um, a few days later, we got a knock on the door and it was David. And we went outside at the, on the path. And he said, I don't know what your problem with her is. He said, she's a really quiet tenant. So the argument carried on and I said to David, I said, I've got two separate heart conditions. I'm not supposed to have stress. I could have a heart attack with this kind of stress in my life. And his attitude was, well, if my wife was married to him, she'd have a bad heart too. Over the next few months, the Woods kept their distance from Annabelle Cooper and were looking forward to a quiet, festive break. It was Christmas Day, and it must have been about nine o'clock when it started. Just after nine o'clock, the noise was unbelievable. They were moving the beds around, putting the beds back together, and everything, it's all sorts of things that was going on. And it just carried on all day, and it was absolutely hell from upstairs. I was really worried about Len. He was so distressed. He was getting more and more, you know, wound up. And so I said, well, I'll call the police. And they said there was nothing to do, they could do. And I just sat there and cried. We had no Christmas dinner, we had no Christmas day. With relations now at an all-time low, Len decided to move on and return to the house maintenance jobs. 
I wanted to paint the top of the house. I gave David 48 hours notice that I was starting painting. So I started painting that morning and I was at the top just getting on with it. Jeanette was at the bottom holding the ladder. And the next thing, a car pulled up. Jeanette said to me, there's a car pulled up here. I said, all right. She says, him. And he knew straight away it was David. What happened next was captured on the next door neighbor's CCTV camera. So I came over to say to him, look, we'll talk to you at the council. We don't want to talk to you here. We're busy working. And he came straight up the path. So then came down the ladder straight away. I went right up to him. And I, he, he coming toward me. I grabbed over. There was no way I could handle it. So I threw him to the floor. I threw him to the floor and I said, bloody stop it, how old are you? And he said, I'm 74. Well, he says, I'm 72. Behave your bloody self. And with that then, I backed back and he was trying to kick me in my privates. I said to him at that point, there's CCTV on next door. And he said, um, I want to get up, I want to get up. And then actually helped him up. And he stormed into the flat saying, get the police, get the police. So I was really shook up and I was shaking. And then just went back up the ladder. 20 minutes later, the police came and they asked me how much notice did they give David and I turned around and said to him, there's the tracking number to prove how much time we actually gave him. And he looked at it and he checked it and he says, you've done everything right, there's no need for you to be worried about it, just carry on painting. The police left and so did David Cooper. But the woods were distraught with how things had descended into a nightmare. The noise gets that bad sometimes that I just go to the radio, pick the radio, turn it right on as loud as I can and just stand there to make sure that she gets the full belt of us upstairs because that's what she's doing to us down here. Because of all the stress that we've gone through, um, we ended up going to the doctors and he prescribed us uh, antidepressants and sleeping tablets. While all this has been going on, we felt as if our life had come to a stop. Um, it just absolutely consumes you. After a year of upset, Len and Jeanette finally got some good news. One morning we came back from shopping and we noticed the removal van parked right where we park our car. And we were amazed to see that Annabelle was moving out. I just couldn't believe our luck that she was finally going out of our life forever. I feel great and I'm glad Jeanette's happy. But she's happy, I'm happy. The Coopers have decided to sell their flat. Len and Jeanette are waiting to find out who their new neighbours will be. In Doncaster, Mandy McEvitt and her boyfriend Carl had fallen out with their neighbours, the Crosslands, after finding human waste in their garden. And that wasn't the only problem. It's a really red hot day, uh, lovely, beautiful outside, and all I wanted to do was sit in my garden. And me and Jerry Crossland were in their garden, and they had We Will, We Will Rock You by Queen absolutely blasting out and the noise was horrific. So I stayed in my house for a bit, but then I went to open my door and Jerry Crossland told me to open So I came in and just shut the door. As the months went by, the noise problems continued. As soon as I went out my house, I'd hear these footsteps and, and I'd hear him rigging his uh, music up and I thought, this is it, it's coming back on. And I felt like, I was being bullied in my own garden. It's horrific having to, to live it, and it's horrendous. It is absolutely horrendous. But the loud music was barely the beginning. I was at home one day and um, I heard a noise, like a howling noise. The Crosslands had in fact bought three dogs. Carl recorded the sounds. There was some noise. Um, that we've had to endure from the Crosslands next door. That's an example of his dogs howling. Marianne McNally was also starting to suffer. I've been angry, I've been upset, I've cried, I have banged on the wall, I've hammered on the wall, I've got now got a hole in my bedroom wall because I've hit it that hard. After suffering for nearly two years, Mandy and Carl could take no more. I told Doncaster Council, I said, this isn't a home, it's a hell hole. Your home should be a sanctuary, and this isn't nowhere near that. The council asked the couple to supply their sound recordings as evidence. I recorded 
no end of things. Horrendous. I got out of bed, I came over here, and it, it sounded like a chiming clock. The only thing was, it was like four in the morning, but it chimed around 11 times, 12 times maybe. It was waking us up every hour, and in the early hours, we got up with a dictaphone and we started to record. It sounded that wild that it was, it was in our bedroom virtually. It was uh, deafening. Never mind how they could sleep through it, it was disrupting our sleep all the time. It's just another form of torture, another, another way to, to, to make us unhappy. Finally, in May 2013, Mandy and Carl's persistence paid off. The day they got the abatement notice, I sat and cried. I thought, this is it now. The nightmare's finally over. But little did I know it was just the start. In Yorkshire, retired police officer Mandy Dunford had been harassed by her neighbour, Kenneth Ward, for five years. He just taunted me and just got pleasure out of the more and more he tortured me. In 2005, after police dropped charges against Ward, Manny had had enough and put her house on the market. It was just too frightening to be at home. I didn't dare stay. So what I did was I put a small caravan in the corner of the field there and I spent a full winter living up here, uh, me and the dogs in the small caravan. And it was freezing and it was wet and the dark really got to you, the endless dark hours. By the spring, the house hadn't sold and reluctantly Mandy decided to move back in. But as soon as she did, Ward resumed his horrifying campaign. Every morning I would take a big deep breath and just prepare myself for, for walking out because I knew what I was in for. And then wherever I moved on my property, he would just chase me about day in, day out. It was unbearable. I was aware that the only way I coped with it was I totally switched off. I, 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 just, I just went into close down and I, I just felt that there was no way out of here. One of the few visitors to the house during this period was Mandy's friend, local handyman, Edward Stonehouse. I used to come and help her, and I used to stay here while I was doing these jobs, you know. And whenever I was here, Kenny never appeared. But one day, he walked across the field, and Ward was finally caught in the act. But it was just sort of like something somebody demented, really. He was just totally out of his head. I mean, dropping his trousers to his waist and doing that is absolutely disgusting. It, it isn't nice to see well, a, lady, a lady living on her own and this happening to her. And I had a witness, and I couldn't believe it. He said he actually felt sick at what he'd been watching. The reason why I exposed myself and masturbated was I, I foolishly thought it would help to get her to move away quicker and, and we'd get rid of her. It was a foolish notion that, that didn't work. Edward persuaded Mandy to go to the police again, since she now had a witness. But yet again, local officers failed to investigate. But it was only when her old friend, Wendy Coulthard, from Police Cadet College, got in touch after many years that Mandy realised things had to change. When Mandy told me what had been happening, I was really, really alarmed and I was horrified at what she was telling me. Wendy offered to help Mandy get the evidence she was desperate for. Hidden in the back of Mandy's truck, she arrived on the farm unseen by Ward. Once I parked here, I would open the motor for Wendy, then I would go to that gap there to just check on the track to see where Psycho was. And I'd be um, looking, and I'd be looking out of the window to see what you were doing, yeah, waiting for yeah. you to beckon me. I would jump out of the van and run straight across to those front doors there and go straight into the house. As soon as I came in, I came straight to the window, I picked up the camera, as soon as I knew Wendy was safely hidden in the house, I came out acting as I usually do, and I was so happy when he came racing down the track and immediately started performing at me. And I just felt, you know, really good it had worked. At 
Over the next three months, Wendy covertly collected shocking and incontrovertible evidence. I wasn't surprised, now that I know the full story, as to why it took so long for Mandy to tell me. She'd been ridiculed and patronised and disbelieved by so many people. And I think part of her was thinking, am I going mad? Am I imagining it? Wendy went to the police with the horrifying footage. When the police arrived to arrest him, me and Wendy wanted to watch what was happening, obviously. We wanted to make the most of this moment, didn't we? We'd waited, I'd waited years for this. So we came running around here. Um, we laid flat on our bellies in the grass. We saw the police actually lead him out of his cottage and put him in a panda car. It was brilliant, wasn't it, Wendy? Yeah, Absolutely it was brilliant, moment. yeah. But was Mandy's nightmare really over? Coming up, the situation in Doncaster becomes unbearable. But all I know is I can't live like this for much longer. And Mandy Dunford receives some devastating news. All I'm doing really is sitting and waiting for him to come home, for my life to just completely erupt, don't I? In Doncaster, Jerry Crossland had been served with a noise abatement notice. I thought things would calm down and this would be the end of the nightmare, but little did I know it was just the start. For some reason now, the Crosslands seem to be turning their hostilities to their other neighbour, Marianne. I'd heard glass dropping on the floor or breaking glass, so I'd gone out to check and there was a large area of big pieces of broken glass where the children play. Marianne suspected the Crosslands were responsible, but didn't have any proof. So she went to speak to Mandy two doors down. I said, look, you know, if, if you do see Mrs Crossland going anywhere near the fence or if you're suspicious in any way, can you please just take a picture or try and get some evidence for me? A few weeks later, Mandy saw her opportunity. I looked out my window and I saw May Crossland and I thought, I've got to grab my tablet. I watched her go out of a gate into a garden and she got some stepladders stood by the fence. She went up her stepladders and she got the bucket in her hand. She leant over the fence and she poured it into Marianne's garden. I couldn't believe what we were seeing. I thought, you want to grow up and act your age. My hands were shaking because I thought, yes, we've got you now and you can't fool a picture. We've finally got you. Try getting out of that one. Marianne claims the deposit was a mixture of broken glass and chicken bones. At the time, I'll be honest, I did not want to go anywhere near Mrs Crossland for fear of what I might do, because I was extremely angry she put my child at risk. I did I have to avoid her because I think I'd have killed her. Marianne called the police. They spoke to Mrs Crossland, but no action was taken. Because of the abatement notice, I think it's made them more hostile towards us and they've turned up the volume even more and they've just took things to another level. They've just gone crazy with it, really. Mrs Crossland told us that since the notice was served on her husband, who is profoundly deaf, she has tried to keep the noise down. She also claims she feels intimidated, assaulted and insulted and lives in fear in her own home. Despite this, Mandy and Carl say that years of stress with next door have taken their toll. It puts a massive strain, a really big strain on your relationship. All the things that you, you got together for, what you like about each other, they all go on the back burner because this, is, this takes over the show. This is the main event. It's all that we've got. feel ill with it all, down, depressed, low, sad. I'd like to um, be happy in my own home, in my own garden. That's all I want out of life, just to live in my house and be happy. But all I know is I can't live like this for much longer. It's driving me crackers. <laughs> In 
In Yorkshire, Mandy Dumford finally had the evidence she needed to get the police to take action against her neighbour, Kenneth Ward. It, it was unbelievable the day he was arrested and I thought, God, it's actually finally over. In December 2011, Kenneth Ward was convicted of firearms offences, exposure and harassment. Police found a loaded Luger pistol under his pillow, along with other illegal weapons, explosives and ammunition. When I found out that they that found the Luger pistol, I knew then it was five years, because it's a mandatory five years for a, a live pistol. You can't get out of it. There's no bodies to unearth can go up to that, so I was expecting at least five years. Most of us, I feel, were shocked when we realised the content of the court case. Silly man. He'd been suffering from depression and he has lots of personal issues going on, but yes, it was shocking. Ward claims his behaviour at this time was out of character. After the death of my mother and my brother, I was sort of all over the place. And if they'd been alive, it wouldn't have entered my head anywhere. I mean, it wouldn't have happened. After 11 years of harassing Mandy, Ward was sentenced to five years in prison. An internal investigation by the police found they had repeatedly failed to meet appropriate investigatory standards. For Mandy, getting back to normal hasn't been easy. It still gives me the creeps to come right down to this part because I still kind of feel him around and it makes my blood go a bit cold. But after only two and a half years in prison, Ward is out. Currently, he's not allowed within a 10 mile radius. I deeply regret it, yeah. I'm not proud of it, no. I'm not, but I can't undo it. Do you understand how that could upset a woman who's all alone? Didn't upset her. That, does that look like a woman who was scared? No, not to me. My plan would have worked if it had, wouldn't it? She would have been gone if she'd been scared. In 2016, Ward will be legally allowed to return to his cottage, just metres from Mandy's home. The fact that he is being allowed by the court system to come back to his house makes me so angry. Why should anybody have to li live their life each and every day, waiting for somebody who's already offended against them to re-offend and do something, not knowing what they're ever going to do? It must be horrific. Mandy feels she now has no choice. After all those years of suffering ward, prolonged by the incompetence of the police, I have been forced out of my home. What quality of life could I ever have staying here, living in total fear? Ward revealed to us that he's not planning to return to the home that his family have rented since 1640. But he also made this chilling statement. I might, just for devilment, because I rent that place, keep the rent on, and she'll, never, she'll always be wondering whether I'm going back or not. If I'm renting it, she won't know whether I'm going back or otherwise. That, that's just my prerogative. All they, they hear, oh, they're staring at my spot. God, they just stood staring into my spot. Oh, that's creepy. For Mandy, any vehicle that comes up the track is a potential threat. All I'm doing really is sitting and waiting for him to come home, for my life to just completely erupt, don't I? Mm, I'd rather just, just be nobody around, you know. Have you got a Nightmare Neighbour story? Get in touch at channel5.com forward slash Nightmare Neighbour. Next time, Neighbours at war over a shared driveway. Oh, and it's looking in now. Oh, my God. <laughs> it just makes me on edge, really on edge. They want this land so bad it hurts them. A cul-de-sac becomes a battlefield. It's been horrendous, actually. You feel like your life's not your own. And family life is under threat. I couldn't understand why anybody would want to ruin our family. She has bullied us and she has made our lives hell. All that as the new series continues next Wednesday at 8. 
There's excitement in the air as we check in at the Holiday Airport for Sunsea and Scousers. That's new tomorrow at 8. Back to tonight and conflicts are out of control with nightmare tenants, slum landlords here on Channel 5. Stay tuned for that new and next.